Hi. Have you ever had a chance to bump into somebody that you knew or were acquainted with in an unexpected place? Well, in 2011, I had a chance to go as a guest of Convoy of Hope down to Haiti to view their feeding programs and to see their disaster relief, uh, what they were doing to help people as they were recovering from the uh, earthquake of 2010. And one of the things that we did one day was we were able to go up into the mountains outside of Port-au-Prince into the jungle to one of the schools where they were feeding about 800 kids. And as we got there one day, uh, we noticed that there was a group of American students who had come down from their Midwest University. And when they were working with Convoy to help teach or to just, you know, serve in whatever capacity they could while they were there. And we didn't get a chance to talk with them, but we toured the facilities and we saw how the, the food was made and distributed and the, the kids were happy. They were wearing their school uniforms. And it's just amazing to see all that. Uh, out in the middle of nowhere. As we were getting ready to leave, one of the students from the university came uh, and approached us and, and she asked and said, well, who are you guys? And, that, and we, I said, well, we're pastors from the Pacific Northwest and we're here with Convoy to kind of see what they're doing. And she said, Pacific Northwest, what part? And I said, well, we're from the Seattle area. The Seattle area? I'm from the Seattle area. I said, well, that's great. I said, well, actually, we're not from Seattle. We're from more the Everett area. Everett area? I'm from the Everett area. And I said, well, that's nice. I said, but I'm, I'm even not from Everett, really. I'm from Snohomish, which is just east of Everett. Snohomish? I'm from Snohomish. And come to find out that she and her family actually live about two blocks away from our church. They, they've always attended a different church uh, than ours, but they live next door. They were neighbors to dear friends of ours who are part of our church. And I've always thought how unique that is. We're 3,400 miles away from home, but we meet up in the jungles of Haiti. And I always thought how uh, amazing that is of God to have that kind of thing take place where we run into each other. Well, that's kind of the background, really, of Philemon. Because what's happening is that the Apostle Paul is under house arrest. He's in Rome. And one day, while well, he's there in Rome, Boom, he comes into contact with Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus. You know, of all the possibilities, whether it's by divine accident of God, or whether Onesimus purposely sought Paul out, you know, the conjecture goes both, both ways. But it's amazing that what happens is that uh, Onesimus comes to faith in Jesus Christ, true faith in Jesus Christ as a result of that encounter and maybe the whole experience of what's going on with Philemon. And so Paul writes this letter to his friend Philemon uh, in, in the area of Colossae because the church of Colossians is meeting in his home or one of the churches in Colossians is meeting in his home. And he writes this letter on behalf of Onesimus, his runaway slave. And it is uh, an amazing piece of literature uh, that reflects some really socially relevant uh, elements, not only then, but also for us today. And if you want to find Philemon, you, you will find it tucked between Paul's letter to Titus and the letter to the Hebrews. So it's, it's a one-page um, letter that you will find it's 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 in some ways it's ignored because it's so short because it seems to be so personal but I think it has great relevance to uh, our life and and it was really great in shaping attitudes about slavery in that day and age uh, it's it's an amazing story again Onesimus finds Paul and there's a couple things that are causing some issues between him returning to be uh, with Philemon and his family. Number one, being a runaway slave, there were harsh penalties, even penalties unto death, if you were a runaway slave and you um, you, you tried to go back. I mean, if they, they caught you, if they found you, there, there'd be tremendous repercussions. The other thing is that apparently Onesimus stole from Philemon in order to leave and go to Rome. And so whether he took money or whether he took, you know, product that he was able to sell and convert into money, he stole that way. The second thing is that he stole from Philemon because being Philemon's property and being taken away or removing himself, that was stealing. He was basically stealing himself away, um, but it would have been considered theft. And then the third way was that 
by being gone, he was stealing from Philemon potential earnings that being in the household he could potentially uh, earn for his master. And so he was costing Philemon a lot of money by running away. And we don't really know in terms of the context of how long all this was going on. But that was part of the setting in which Paul writes this letter to Philemon. It has huge immediate and future impact uh, to the church in Colossae as well as to the household of Philemon and to those of us who live in this day and age as well. It's because Paul is going to ask his friend Philemon to uh, free Onesimus. He's going to ask him to do something really huge, uh, really big. But he has confidence in Philemon. He has confidence in Philemon's character because he knows this person. He has confidence in, in his relationship with God. He has confidence in Philemon. But he's going to ask him to do something that's huge. He's going to ask him to forgive his debt. He's going to ask Philemon to forgive Onesimus's theft. He's going to ask Philemon to forgive Onesimus's betrayal of trust. And that Philemon broke that trust. But now Paul's going to say, yeah, but I also want you to trust him again because he's been changed, because he's met Jesus, because Christ has come into his life. And so all these things that he has done, Paul's saying, I want you to forget that and do something really huge to receive him back as a fellow believer in Christ Jesus and as a potential ministry team member to the Apostle Paul. Paul's just kind of asking for some really huge stuff in this really small letter. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, it's one thing to forgive in private for uh, something or for someone who I'm never going to see again, and I don't have to see their face, I don't have to deal with them. They're kind of one and done, gone, forgotten, I don't have to deal with that. But it's more challenging for me, I don't know about you, but it's more challenging for me if I have to see that person day after day after day after day, if I'm always continually reminded of their presence, uh, that means I really have to go to God to forgive and let God help me to forgive and help me to let go of resentment and bitterness and anger um, and feeling that I've been uh, uh, offended against. I mean, Philemon's being asked to do some pretty amazing things. It's not just one thing, it's multiple things. And not only is Paul putting uh, Philemon on, the, on the, uh, the end to do all these things, but what Philemon does will have repercussions in his household, in his church, and in his community. Because to forgive a runaway slave, to not uh, cause them to have to pay any penalty of any kind, was huge. Again, Onesimus stole product. He stole from... Um, Philemon in terms of time and effort and energy. And whatever Philemon does is going to be noticed by his other slaves because if he's got one, he's got probably more. And in some cases, it seems like he's fairly wealthy. So he has probably a multitude of slaves. And so whatever he does with Onesimus, I'm sure that Philemon's other slaves are going to say, hey, what about us? And so that's going to have impact. And then the other slaves associated with the church in Colossae, because they're meeting in Philemon's home, they're going to say, hey, master, if he did this for Onesimus, what are you going to do for us? And then people who are more generally a part of the community of Colossae, they're going to say, did you hear what happened with Philemon and his slave? And then the people in the region and the outer communities of Colossae are going to say, did you hear what happened in Colossae with this guy by the name of Philemon. It has tremendous impact to affect many, many people uh, beyond just the scope or the household or the church in Colossae or in the household of Philemon. So it, it, I want to ask this question. When was the last time that you were asked to do something good but really hard by God? When was the last time that that God asked you to do something that was really hard. You know it's good. You know it's probably the right thing to do, but you also know it was it was hard. And with Philemon, it had tremendous cost, not only financially, but it also had a big cost socially, 
economically, personally, and his relationship with God and with others. And so Paul seems to be not asking for an awful lot, but boy, it's a lot. And it's a challenging thing. I think it's important for us to kind of wrestle with this a little bit because it's often said that the Bible endorses or condones slavery, which I believe it does not. What the Bible does do is that the Bible was written in a time when slavery was very much a reality in the world that the Bible was written. And the biblical authors wrote on how to treat people who were slaves in that world of slavery. You know, how to how to treat them well, how to be, be kind, how to be generous, how to deal with, with people who were coming in who were slaves. Um, and so I think the, the Bible deals with just the reality of the world that they were living in at that time. But one of the things that we do know is that the followers of Jesus believe in and teach equality, that God loves people and that God doesn't gauge us uh, depending upon what, what class we are or what race we are. Paul wrote to the churches in the region of Galatia in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. So that deals with racial issues. There's neither slave nor free. That deals with economic status and class. There's neither male and female. That talks about the value that God places upon each gender, um, male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so from God's perspective, that everyone it has great value. Everyone is, is beneficial and no one is greater than the other as far as God is concerned. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is that, is that historically the leaders of the freedom or abolitionist movements throughout history have been Christians. Christian leaders, Christian uh, normal general people, that everybody has, has embraced this idea of helping people become free, especially in the history of the United States. In the Greco-Roman world at the time that the apostle was writing, in that first century AD, first century CE, depending upon how you want to grade that, there was 25 to 40 percent of the population in the Greco-Roman world were slaves. That's a lot of people. And it was, it was based upon um, not racial issues, but it had more to do with economic, had to do with uh, winners and losers in wars. And so there was much a reality that they had to deal with. How are we going to treat people? How are we going to deal with people? But this prompted me to think about what are we doing now about slavery? Because there is slavery in our world now. And are we aware of it? And are we concerned about it? And are we doing anything about that as, as society at large, as well as Christians specifically? According to the Global Slavery Index, uh, Modern day slavery is a multi billion dollar industry with just the forced labor aspect generating in the United States $150 billion or $150 billion in the United States dollars, I should say, excuse me. And that the index has estimated that around the world there's over 40 million people who are in modern day slavery. And I'm assuming and presuming that that's a very conservative number because I'm sure that there's no way that we can know all the people that are involved. That, and that 71% of those people are women, and one in four of those 40 million people are children. So today, with such causes as Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ plus issues and a critical race theory and reparations and COVID, and you know the list can go on and on as to things that people are outraged about. Where's the outrage about slavery today? We tend to be focused on slavery 150 some years ago, but where's the outrage about slavery around the world today in terms of sex slavery and the trafficking of people around the world? And if you don't even want to look around the world, let's talk about the United States. What about the sex slavery and the trafficking of children and women in the United States? Where's the outrage? Where's the outrage about uh, children being used as brides uh, you know, being sold as brides or being given as brides uh, in various different settings. Uh, where's our outrage about that? Where's the outrage about work slavery or sweatshops in order for us to have the fanciest, nicest uh, luxuries that, that money can buy? Where's our outrage? You know, we, 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 we pick our outrages. We pick the things that we're, we get excited about or outraged about. 
But th these are things that God says are about people. Slavery is about people. And how are we treating people? Do you know that at every large sports gathering, there's an increase in sex trafficking? That at every Super Bowl, at every World Cup, at every business convention, there's an uptick in sex slavery. People are being forced into uh, doing things that they never wanted to do. And where's our outrage? We kind of turn a blind eye. And one of the things that, that jumps out at me in this letter that Paul writes to Philemon is not just the issue of slavery, but what are we doing about it in our day and our age? We tend to look at the Bible, or people tend to look at the Bible and say how out of date they were, but where's our outrage for what's going on today? And whether we are Christians, especially as Christians, we should be leading the march to free people. And one of the things that I'm really pleased about as, as uh, our church here at Faith Church is that we are involved in partnering with strategic partners around the world in places uh, that we cannot mention who are engaged with trying to set people free from sex trafficking, from uh, sex slavery, from places that, that they do not want to be. And, and we want to encourage you to help them um, continue that work uh, and engage with them. And we have to be very careful about uh, talking about that, but, but they're very much involved in that. And I'm very proud and pleased to be able to be participant with that. Uh, matter of fact, there's one friend of mine who's involved in a group that uh, we'll include in the description, but it's part called StopTraffickingProject.com. StopTraffickingProject.com. And they're all about helping people become aware of what the problems are and to be careful so that they don't fall victims to the issues and the problems of, of sex slavery or sex trafficking. One of, the, one of the positive things to, to think about this letter that Paul writes to Philemon is that we have every confidence to believe that Philemon heard what he was being asked and responded in the affirmative to set Onesimus free, to begin this whole journey of freedom and from slavery to freedom. Uh, he honored Paul's request, and the, the letter would have been read to the Colossian church as well, the church that was meeting in Philemon's home. And so... He sets a great example on being generous, not only financially, but being generous with his attitude and with his perspective. He did the hard things that he was asked to do because they were the right things to do. And I think that one of the things that's going to come out as a result of this, of us looking at this letter to Philemon, is that there's going to be something that God speaks to each and every one of us that may be a hard thing for us to do, but it's a good thing in the end that it is beneficial, um, but it may be challenging for us and it may cause us to be stretched. It may cause us to think in ways we never thought before. But I, my hope is that you will be stirred as we look at this letter a little bit more, just as I am stirred. And so I just want to ask as, as I kind of wrap this up with just a little bit, is that is God asking you to do something that is good, but might be hard to do? Maybe God's already been talking to you about something and you've been kind of later, 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 I'll do it later. But maybe now's the time that God's just kind of asking you, laying that before you. So I want to encourage you to, to consider that, to prayerfully allow God to engage with you in that regard. And the second thing is this, is, is are you in right relationship with God? Are you right with God? Because if we're not in right relationship with God, all of this is meant, part of what this is, does is it, points us towards God to where, God, I need you to help me be the person you're wanting me to be, to respond in the way you want me to respond. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you've got stuff that's been going on in your life, give it to God. God, forgive me, cleanse my heart, make my heart right, help me to follow you faithfully, um, and do it your way, not my way. And when we pray that sincerely, God changes our hearts. He forgives us, wipes all that junk and garbage out of the way so that we can be right with God. And then finally, think about something that you can do this week to help advance the kingdom of God in our world. Maybe it's something that you can say, some positive thing that you can do, casual encouragement to someone that you run into. But those kinds of things that we do can really make a big difference 
in the world. I mean, Paul asked Philemon to do something in Colossae that has had great repercussions down through history because one man said yes. I hope you have a great week. Talk to you later.